So welcome, welcome, welcome. I thank you all for joining me on this podcast today. I have a lovely, lovely, beautiful woman today that I'm interviewing. And this guest, she's not only beautiful, but she is a true woman of virtue and with many layers and is truly phenomenal. Please welcome my guest, model, speaker, mentor, and my friend, Renee Mohead Davis. Miss Renee, are you there? I am here. Thank you so much for that lovely welcome, Marsha. I am so Oh, glad you are you. quite welcome. <laughs> Thank you. You are quite well welcome. Quite it's welcome indeed. Good. Thank you for the invitation. You are quite welcome. So today, first, I would like to talk about, um, tell us a little about your modeling career. And when did it begin and how? My modeling career, strangely enough, I call myself a late bloomer. My modeling career began when I was 40 years old, quite by accident. <clears throat> like most little girls, you know, you always want to be a model with the beautiful clothes. And back when I was a teenager, I was quite skinny. I was the olive oil of the group. And so I wanted to be a model. So um, my flat chest and flat behind would, you know, count for something. <laughs> so, but it never happened, of course, when you're a teenager, because back then there weren't any um, black models. Beverly Johnson, I think, was the very first black model. And um, that, you know, opened up my eyes and said, well, maybe one day, but then you go on about your business. But at the age of 40, I was taking my oldest daughter to the mall for her fitting. They were having a back to school fashion show. And so I drove her to the mall. She was about 15 at the time. And I took her to the office for her fitting. And uh, I walked in and the lady said, oh my goodness, do you model? We need older models. And at the time I had just lost my corporate job about a few months before. So I was thinking, paycheck, mm -hmm. groceries, feed children. Yes, I can model. <laughs> <laughs> so she booked me. Right. <laughs> I was terrible, but the reaction of the audience, you rarely see older women on the runway. And mm -hmm. so the reaction of the audience was, was very positive. And although I was scared to death, I was very encouraged to see that the women were very appreciative to see, you know, women my age. And I was graying too at the time. So uh, it was a great experience. And the lady who had um, since become my friend she kept mm -hmm. booking me for mall fashion shows and seeing the, and that was the beginning of when they started, uh, the, the industry started to book older models and recognizing that it is a viable market to start, you know, yes. marketing clothes and things too. And that was back yes. in the, um, the late 80s. And um, wow. I started mar marketing and uh, modeling and uh, I guess the gray hair started to help too. So, yes. Wow. So, so we can say you are actually one of the pioneers then, you know, at that time. I would like time. to say so. I would like <laughs> to say so on a very small scale. <laughs> right, right, yes. right. But nevertheless, you're still one of the first, you know, to open that door for that market, being an older woman, you know, to model. I, I would I would like to say that absolutely in Atlanta at the time because it was not something that you saw at all. You saw a lot of the right. um, teenage girls and but it was interesting. It's like who in the world is going to wear mother the bride clothes? Not a sixteen year old, <laughs> for goodness sakes. Right. <laughs> I had started modeling in the bridal shows and they needed someone to to model mother of the bride clothes. And of course it wasn't going to be the younger girls so there was there was a place for me and unfortunately they didn't have that many gowns for mothers of the bride and so they started putting me in wedding gowns <laughs> and I wow. said well there's no problem with that because older women we get married again you know mm -hmm. and so that mm -hmm. was fun and so I was doing that for quite a few years and 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 that was a lot of fun oh yeah. that's awesome that is awesome and I know that um in the past, you started a foundation, um, which you, you no longer have now, but what prompted you to start that foundation? It was, um, it was a nonprofit, mm -hmm. and 
Well, long story. That was back in the day when I was working in corporate America. And I had been working there for 12 to 15 years in the Bell system. And that was also the beginning of the corporate downsizing. And some of the people were starting to lose their jobs. Mm -hmm. Um, That's when corporate America was starting to look at its bottom line and not concerned so much with the employees, but their bottom line. And you knew that, you know, not too long before that, there were people that were staying in corporate America for 30 years and they'd retire and get their watches. Well, that, you know, has, is long gone. The bottom line was their biggest concern. Well, you know, I kind of, of course. that. yeah, that was, that was a mess, but you know, what happens, you know, when you lose your corporate job, you know, it's like, excuse me, wait a minute, what do I do? I've got kids, you know, at that time right. I was divorced with two children. And so I couldn't find another comparable job at the time. And so you get frantic, you go through your savings and it's like all of a sudden, every job you apply to is you're overqualified, you're overqualified. I'm like, yo, (laughs) I'll I'll do anything at this point. So you you start to get to the point of desperation and uh, you're applying for whatever you can do, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and uh, you've got children to feed. And so it was a very difficult time. And during that time, that's when I started modeling. And that's when I started to recognize the hand of God opening doors for me. Right, right. <laughs> and it's and funny that you're saying that because this, we actually, a lot of people are in this time right now where they're going through some tough financial, you oh. know, not being able to find a job. Same thing, you know, right now that's what's happening with the pandemic and, you know, and, and businesses not being able to open. But look at what you did. You found something that could help spark something in you to do something different at that time when you were going through that. So that's very interesting that you could talk about that now at this time. And you know what's interesting, though? It, it allows me to have a peace now because I've gone through it before and it allows me to encourage others because when you go through some adversity and some tribulation you know the Bible even says that it allows you to encourage and support others that are going Mm. through the same thing that you went through so yeah I've been through that and well I'm kind of going through it now as a flight Mm -hmm. attendant and guess Mm -hmm. what guess who's not flying right now because of the same right Right. But the situation is very different now than it was back then. And so, yes, mm-hmm. so I'm, I'm not in the same position. But back then, I was in a situation that said, okay, I've got these two children. And they like to eat every day. You know, they would, right. say, <laughs> they would like to say, well, mom, what's for dinner? And I'm, I'm tempted to say, didn't I feed you yesterday? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Wait, yesterday? <laughs> Right. Trying to be, you know, trying to be funny, trying to keep it light. Mm-hmm. But on the inside, it's like, okay, God, we've got some work to do here. Right. <laughs> I can't do this by myself. So to be perfectly honest, my, my faith was strengthened during that tribulation period. It was yes. truly strengthened. It was tested and it was strengthened mm-hmm. during that time because um, I was able to see doors opening. I was able to humble myself and say, okay, um, I'm not going to get the big corporate job right now, but I'm willing to do whatever I need to do to feed these children. You know, right. I was able to humble right. myself and do whatever I needed to do. If I had to, you know, go to a food bank, if I had to, whatever, mm-hmm. you know. Right. Because we can't be, af- we can't be ashamed and embarrassed when we're in need. And when we're in need, you can't be ashamed and afraid to ask for help. Ask for right. help. Because there are people right. out there that are willing to help just like right now, you know, you can't mm-hmm. be ashamed to ask for help because there are people willing to help. That's right. Ask. But if you don't ask, if you, ask. you need help. Exactly. Right. Exactly. That's why you have to ask because sometimes people are masking what they're really going through. So no one knows. Everybody thinks you're okay when you're really not okay. Really so not okay. you have to ask. Yes. And I know sometimes it's embarrassing, you know, if you have right. to give back, you know, I had to give back my, um, what did I have at the time? I don't know. Was it a, an Acura or something like that? You know, so I had mm-hmm. to turn my Acura back in and it's like starting to ride the buses. Well, 
Well, yeah, I, I didn't have right. time to be embarrassed. I had to get downtown to look for exactly, jobs, you know, so, you know, it's, I know it's embarrassing and people would look at me funny and some people would say, you know, talk behind your back. But see, that's when you know who are, who are your friends. Right. Who are, not your, who are friends. your friends? Exactly. Exactly. So you read exactly. a lot of people out. But then, interestingly, some of those same people who talked behind my back, if they see, saw me in a commercial or they saw me in a print ad, they became my friends again all of a sudden. Oh, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. So I'm sure. You get, people, <laughs> you get to see who people really are when you're in mm-hmm. a tough situation. But then you also see... Uh, the love that some people really have, because when you start to really get on your knees and pray and seek God mm-hmm. and say, Father, I, I cannot do this by myself. I really need yes. your help. And you're praying and you're crying out to the Lord and someone knocks on your door with eight bags of groceries. And it's like, wow. And it can happen just like that, right? Like just like that. That. And I'm saying, In less than 24 hours. So yes. you know he's real. You know he's real. I'm saying yes. And she was saying, "Girl, I was just shopping, and the Lord told me to bring these groceries over to you." And I'm saying, "Get out of here!" Wow, amazing, yeah. amazing. So oh. I know that I know that I know, you know. And so it's just a matter yeah. of taking the time to listen. Yes, if you've got to cry, cry. But there were times when I felt so low that I was trying to think of who could I give my children to because I felt I was such a bad mother. And my daughter said, we are not going anywhere. We're staying here. And I tell you, boy, um, I, I, I got a newspaper route. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I started Mm -hmm. throwing Mm -hmm. newspapers and it was a hard job, but I do remember like on Christmas Eve and my daughters and I would go out, they'd go with me sometimes and we would, (laughs) snowing and as we would make a joke of it or something i'd say okay you take this paper and you go to that house wait a minute and you go to that house i'm gonna go to this house we're gonna race okay get on your mark mm-hmm. go and so we'd make a joke out of it we'd make fun you made, know? A, made it fun <laughs> made it fun slipping and sliding in the snow trying to throw the newspapers and get back to the car and i mean they were just but when you were in need you do what you have to do you do what you have to do right that's right. it. There's no shame in doing what you have because you have to provide. You know, yeah. you have to provide for yourself. And so there's no shame in that at all. You know, and when and when he sees that you're doing the best that you know to do, he mm-hmm. will send people to help you. Because here I had a daughter in high school and I had a daughter in a private uh, elementary school. And mm-hmm. I was going to have to take the daughter, my daughter out of the private school. And they said, no, we understand what's happening. And we're just yeah. going to give her a scholarship for the rest of the time she's going to be here. Wow, and look at that. That's right. My older daughter had been admitted to Spelman. Wow. <laughs> so I'm saying, wow. Wow is right. So I'm oh saying, my okay, gosh. Okay. And she wanted to stay on campus. I'm saying, okay, 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 okay. <laughs> and so, so how are we going to do this? But anyway, long story made short, you know, there were all kinds of programs that we were able to apply for. Mm-hmm. Then we got, and she wanted to live on campus. And they were saying, if you live in the Atlanta area, you can't live on campus. Those rooms are for people that live out of state and, 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 and. Right. But, they opened it up and said, well, yeah, she can live on camp. It's so many things. And then she started school and then they came to her and they said, we were looking at your application and we saw that you had a lot of community service. And she was even working with me on the, um, on my nonprofit at the shelter. So she mm-hmm. also had, um, she was also working in the church, uh, children's, um, children's church. And so that, mm-hmm. along with some of the other community service that she had, um, got her qualified to get a community service scholarship, a Bonner scholarship at Spelman. Wow. And so we didn't even know there was such a thing. They came to her and <laughs> gave her a scholarship. Wow. Oh, so my gosh. Blessings came that we oh didn't even know. Oh, my goodness. We just continued to pray, humble ourselves, still give to That's others it. as much as we could. So. You know, so I am not as worried as I was back then. I'm in a different situation now than I was. Right. Because now I'm married. Right. I have a husband. 
Mm -hmm. things are so different, but there's a peace in my spirit because I know where I was last time and I know how he yes. took care of me last time. Yes. And so yes. as I came out of that situation, there was a renewed spirit within me, a renewed mm -hmm. spirit of service, of dedication to God. Um, yes. And my daughters also saw, saw that life is not always easy, but you That's have right. I know it because some kids are so privileged that they have everything that they want. Mm -hmm. and they don't recognize mm -hmm. that life is not always fair. Life is That's right. easy. Life can kick you in the head, but you oh, still it sure can. Kids have to be taught that even through life's most difficult and darkest times, you still can find a way through. But you can't do it by yourself. You can't do it by yourself. No. No, you need. You definitely need that support system. And so, you definitely need that. And this, and having that faith, you know, and really believing and trusting, having that faith. You you have to have that. You can't give up when things look bad. You you just have to hang in there and tough it out, weather the storm. But the kids have to see you doing that. The kids have to see. Right. They have to see the fact that you are struggling. They have to see you on your knees praying. They have to see you crying. But they mm -hmm. also have to see you saying, thank you, Father, because I didn't know how I was going right. to feed the kids today. And look at the blessing that you brought me to the door. So it was a matter of letting my children know that in spite of the difficulties we were having, we were still being blessed. Mm -hmm. And in spite of yes. the difficulties we were still having, we were still going to bless other people other people because, you know, we were having challenges and difficulties, but then when we were able, we became the face, the new face of homelessness. Right. Because we had been there, done that. We were also able exactly. to, because we had experienced that same thing. We had experienced the challenges. Right. To let people know that homelessness is not just people laying out on the, on the benches. There are people like myself, right other women who and are myself see right and we can we can go ahead and work a day job or get a temp job you know because that's right. what I finally was able to do get extended long-term mm -hmm. temp jobs well you can live in extended stay motels and that's what we were able exactly to do, to get back on your feet and that's when you're able exactly. to go out and help other people and as you continue that's to help it. other people you can get back on your feet and help others get back on their feet that's what it's all mm -hmm. about. That's what it's all about. Be, being of service. That's what it's all about. Definitely. All about. And you've all, and just not to sh shift gears, but just to even mention now, one of the other things that you, that the challenges that you faced was, you know, being diagnosed with cancer. You know, how was that for you? And how did you manage to get through that? And thank goodness, thank God today you are cancer free. Thank yes. you. That yes. is a blessing. Absolutely. That is wonderful. So tell us about that. Well, I am the daughter of a, of a three-time breast cancer survivor. My mom um, not only had breast cancer three times, prior to that, when she was 27, she had multiple, no, she had um, Hodgkin's disease when she was 27 years old. They did not expect her to live, mm -hmm. but my mother, she was a fighter. Not only did she live, she yes. lived and she said, I want to raise my daughters. She raised her daughters. She saw her grandchildren. But then when she was 36, I was in high school, she had breast cancer. Now, back then in the 60s, people didn't talk about breast cancer that much. They don't talk about mm -hmm. self-exams. But she did have breast cancer, and we lived in Connecticut at the time. So she had to go. She told me she had lumps in her breasts. And I did not know that they were going to remove her breasts, but they ended up removing both of her wow. breasts. And that was like, that mm. was traumatizing for all of us because that was not something we expected. That was not something we knew about. That was just unreal. And from that time on, they said they found like two different, two or three different kinds of cancer in her breasts. She went to wow. Yale New Haven Hospital at the time. And I remember how traumatized I was and it was like something I had never heard of before. In school, people were, oh, where'd you go? There you go. Oh. People were right. feeling sorry for me, and they would let me um, kind of walk out of school, and I'd get on the train from Bridgeport and 
get on a train to New- Yale New Haven Hospital and go see my mom. And, you know, it was just really interesting, but it was really very, very difficult for us. Yes. And then my father, being the father of five daughters, he was, um, it really affected him as well, too. So he really impressed upon us the importance of checking our breasts monthly. I think it was like the 70s or 80s when it started to become really important to start to check your breasts for for lumps. And so he really made it important to do that. And my mother too, but she had to have um, a mastectomy, a double mastectomy. So she didn't have to worry about checking anymore, but she she got breast cancer uh, again in the residual breast tissue. So she, they had to go back in and mm. get the breast cancer out of that residual breast tissue. And then about, um, I can't remember how many years after that, she had to go back in because they found another mass inside of her chest. And they said, yes, that was breast cancer again. And I'm saying she doesn't have any breasts. What in the world? Right, right. Guys. But fortunately, they were able to get that too. Now, my mom, um, so this was three times breast cancer, Hodgkin's disease, and then she had a quintuple bypass. And then again, before she passed, she had another type of cancer, which is called multiple myeloma, which is, I think, a bone marrow type of um, cancer. But she never mm-hmm. quit, and she said, Cancer is not taking me out. And it did not take wow. her. It was in remission. And then she got to a place where I was old enough for her to have a conversation. She said, sweetheart, mommy's just tired. I'm just tired. Right. This is not taking me out. But she made a decision that she was just going to, you know, she's out of here. But anyway, um, and I agreed with her decision. You know, Mm -hmm. it was important to my father that his five daughters know how to um, do a breast self-exam. And I did. We were right. very careful. And I had fibrocystic breasts. And a lot of um, Black women have uh, fibrocystic breasts where we get those little cysts every month. Yes. Yes, yes I, ha- I had those too. Right. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. But because of my history, my family history, um, I had to get them checked and made sure that they were cysts. And most of the time, the doctor said, yes, this is a cyst. We're going to watch it. It'll probably collapse on its own or we will go ahead and aspirate it, or in other words, pull the, um, the fluid out of the cyst, or we will take it out. So we had those choices. Usually it would just collapse on its own, or we would do what they called a fine needle aspiration, an FNA, where they would insert a needle and kind of withdraw the fluid and let it collapse. And there were some times when they would uh, surgically uh, take it out, remove it, and biopsy it to make sure that it was not cancerous at all. Right. So I had several surgical biopsies. I think it was three. I had quite a few uh, fine needle aspirations where they collapsed the fluid. And then so whenever I had a new, and usually I knew where the little cysts were. Okay, yeah, that's the same one. Yeah, that's the same one. Oh, here's a new one. So I call the doctor. Okay, let's check it out. So we go check it out. Okay, let's go ahead and aspirate that one or let's watch that one. And so one day I felt another little cyst. And so I called the doctor and she says, okay, well, let's, you know, come on in and let's check it out. I went in to check it out. And, um, but I knew, you know, in my spirit, and this one's a diff, this one's different, even though it was just a tiny little it was smaller than a pea. And so I said, this one's different. And so I went in and at Grady Hospital in Atlanta, it's a teaching hospital. So they would have either the Morehouse medical doctors there or the Emory doctors there. Mm -hmm. And okay, I'm just going to say it. Morehouse medical doctors, perfect. They took time with you. They were um, primarily minority doctors, black doctors, Indian doctors, Okay, and they took time. They spoke mm-hmm. with you. They were patient. They were kind. They were everything that you would need them to be. The Emory doctors, mm-hmm. from Emory University, were very different. They were Caucasian, um, and they were different. And every time hmm. I go to Grady, and the Emory doctors were there either if I go to the breast center or if I go for something else over the years, 
there was a distinct difference between the Emory doctors, the Caucasian doctors, and the Morehouse medical doctors. And nobody wow. can tell me that I'm imagining things because I've seen the difference myself over and over and over again. And so um, mm. I will talk to anybody about my personal experience about it, but I'll tell you one thing. Every time I dealt with an Emory doctor, I distinctly felt like they were either rushing me or they were speaking down to me or they were in a hurry, like, okay, I really don't want to be here, but since I have to be here and do my residency here, I'll just do it and go, or they would be rough. I've had a fine needle aspiration where he was rough and it was painful. The one that I went to where there was this one when I knew this one was different, and I knew in my spirit, I felt in my spirit before I went, it was different. I knew that it was cancer, but it was not unto death. That's what I got in my spirit. I went to this doctor and mm. she was trying to put the needle into the cyst and she couldn't get it in. And so it was, she was trying and she was trying and it was starting to get irritated and it was starting to hurt and starting to swell. Then the other oh. doctor that was there trying to show her, I think she may have been a resident or an intern. I don't know. She said, well, let's watch it for six months. And I said, no, not this one. Thank you very much. So I got dressed and went out to the nurse. She was my favorite nurse. I said, when are the Morehouse doctors going to be here? She said, next Friday. I said, put me on the schedule, please. And I explained to her, I said, I'm not coming anymore when the Emory doctors come. Sorry. Anybody who's mm -hmm. listening to this from Emory University, you can call me if you want to. And because right. you all need to change your bedside manner. And I will tell you why, because your doctors are not the way you deal with the African-American community is wrong. Look now, that's for a whole nother show too, okay. right? But it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, I experienced it for myself and right. not just at Emory, but other places too. But in, mm -hmm. anyway, so when I went back the next Friday, there was Dr. O'Coley from Morehouse. And basically he said, well, why don't we just go ahead and take it out? And so I said, yes, can we do that today? He said, no, we'll just have to schedule, it, schedule the operating room, which we did. He, we took it out. But you know what he did? Before he put me under, he stopped all the nurses that were in the operating room. He says, let's take a moment and pray. I loved wow. it. I loved it. I loved wow. it. And then he put me under. And so um, then he called me back and he told me that, yes, we found something behind that little nut. Because what, what they found, they, when they take out the, the cyst, they also take out uh, some tissue around it. Mm -hmm. And what they found in the tissue around it was um, a little bit of, they found some cancer. It wasn't the, the, the cyst that I felt, but they found the cancer that was almost stage one. We caught it so early. Oh, we that was a blessing. So early that I would, all, all I had was a lumpectomy. They took that little lump out and mm -hmm. radiation therapy for I think six weeks, six or eight weeks. And so that's the importance of early detection. And so wow. that is why it's important for women to check their breasts. Right, right. Um, because Definitely. early detection will save your life. It will save your life. And, and yeah, and that is so true because after I spoke to you when we had our conversation prior to this interview, you know, and I was telling you that you know, I have a cyst above my left breast and I never paid it any attention. Now I've had a mammogram before and I am due for another one. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, I really wasn't going to go again because like, eh, it doesn't bother me. I'm not going to bother it. Eh, it's fine. Mm -hmm. But when you told me, when you said that it was behind the cyst, I said, well, you know what? Maybe I do need to have it looked out and have them go ahead and remove it and do a biopsy. It's better to be safe than sorry. So I want to thank you for that, Renee. So I'm going to schedule my appointment. I will. I'm going to schedule my appointment. Very <laughs> yes, good. thank you. Very good. Yes, Very good. I am. better to be safe than sorry, to be honest with you. Right. You know, right. because you don't want to look back and say, you know, I should have. Mm-hmm. You know, so. No, exactly. Exactly. So get you, if you're feeling anybody out there that's feeling fearful, 
yeah, the mammogram for me, my experience was it, it was a little discomforting, right? You know, because yeah. they have to squash your boobs this way and flat and sideways, you know, and don't do all of that stuff. But I tell you, it is worth it. It is, it worth, is worth it. it. But let me tell yeah, you, if definitely. you're going to go and do it, do not go the week before your period because you're tender. Oh, right. right. I, get the mam- I did that once. I don't ever go. Don't schedule your mammogram the week before your period. Schedule okay, so that's good for me to know. Yeah. So uh, other than that, it's important. It is really important. The reason why it's important is because we tend to, we as black women tend to get the disease more often than, than Caucasian women. And we don't know why it, I don't know why I, I don't know if they've done studies as to why, but we die, we die more frequently of the disease. Now that has a lot to do with maybe access to medical Maybe it has to do right. with underinsured or uninsured. Maybe mm-hmm. a lot of things, but maybe it has to do with um, fear, um, lack right. of education. I don't know, but right. we need to get in there and deal with it. Now, had I now I wasn't working at the time, so I did not have insurance. I wasn't afraid mm-hmm. about the lumps because of my mother. If my mom could go through that piece of cake for me. What scared me was I did not have insurance. And so I started crying because I'm saying, oh, my God, how am I going to pay for this? I don't have insurance. That's what's right. You wasn't even worried about the lump. You were more concerned that you didn't have insurance. Exactly. Wow. Incredible. I was worried about that. I cried about that. I worried about that. But little did I know that Georgia had a plan that would for women that had breast cancer that would pay for everything. I had to pay a dime. So, you know, it's like, I mean, that is so amazing. I'm telling you, I'm telling you before you give up, you just people have to tap into their resources. Really exactly. do. You have to tap into your resources, do your research, search on the internet, look up programs, you know, wow. Talk you to just don't know what's available. There are social workers in the hospital that will tell you about resources that are available. But see, sometimes we just right. allow fear to shut us down. Fear will right. shut you down. And it was about to shut right. me down. You know, I'm saying, where do I go? What do I do? Mm-hmm. But see, we mm-hmm. have to be our best advocates for our health because there are times people are not looking out for our best interests. We know that. Right. So we have to right. look out for each other. That's right. We have to. We have to do that. That's right. We definitely have to do that. We have to look out for our own best self-interest, our own survival for ourselves. It's, it's so important because like you said, you know, no one else is going to care more than we're going to care for ourselves. Yeah, yeah, so we have to take care of ourselves and our own, for sure. I agree with you 100% on that, for sure. And I'm so glad, again, that, you know, you were able to fight that. I mean, you've been through some things, you know, you and, and, you, and you're still here, beautiful as ever, amazing and beautiful. You know, I have to s- s- share this story that on my old website uh, um, that I had your picture on it, and I had no idea who you were. All I knew was... This woman is beautiful. She is gorgeous. I'm putting her, I hope she don't come from looking for me saying I'm using her picture without permission. I'm using her picture. She's gorgeous, right? And I think, I think you, how did, I don't know how we found each other on Instagram somehow. I think, did you comment on the picture somehow? I don't, I don't remember. And I was like, that's her. That's the woman. That is her. Oh my gosh. I was like, oh my God, this is her. Oh my gosh, she's so beautiful. And I was like, I have your picture. <laughs> I was like, I have your picture. I was just like so amazed and baffled. I was like, I really got to see who she is. She's a real person. <laughs> you know, <laughs> beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. Thank so I want to ask you now, what do you do for self care and anti aging and looking so beautiful as ever? <laughs> always, you know, always come and say always beautiful. You know that. Oh my goodness. Thank you. I, you know, You're I welcome. am a human being person, you know, I have, you know, my yes. flaws and everything I, I do. I've dealt with um, depression, 
clinical depression, you know, because when you lose a job Mm -hmm. and you don't know how to feed, you're going to feed your children and you beat yourself up, you have negative self-talk. So all of that stuff, you know, really, you know, beat me down. So, you know, I had to work out of that with help of, with the help of therapy and, and medication. So recognizing that there is help Mm -hmm. for that, you know, is, is helpful. But then also recognizing too, that, um, Oh, something I did recognize too is that when I was helping um, the homeless women, it is sometimes too expensive for um, women who don't have a lot of money, let's just say it that way, to right. eat well. And I noticed mm-hmm. that for the women that were living in our shelter and their children, it was easier and cheaper for them to go down to the convenience store and buy a bottle of soda and a bag of chips than it was for them to go to the grocery store and get healthy food. It was cheaper and easier. And that right there sets you up, sets your body up for illness because it doesn't get the proper nutrients. And when you look at what's in our neighborhood in terms of food Mm -hmm. and healthy choices, you know, you have fast food, joints and and convenience stores and things like that the choices aren't many but then you know you look at the fact that there's not a lot of choices but they make it difficult for us to be able to buy healthy food people don't have a living wage that's mm-hmm. another one of my arguments you know I was working with the homeless yes. and, and sitting on some some boards and commissions it's hard mm-hmm. it's hard for people to to buy healthy foods and live in a decent apartment when they're not being paid a a living wage. You know, thank you, the United States of America. (laughs) Thank you. It's just... Yeah, you're right. And that's definitely something that we definitely need to work towards changing that and and having a new narrative on that because uh, it's so true, you know? Um, and they, and they will tell you too, you'll hear nutritionists also say, you know, even if you buy the frozen vegetables, right? So you could buy frozen vegetables, but there's definitely a way to, to make healthy, to becoming more healthy. We have to make it a lifestyle. It's not a diet. It's just a lifestyle that we have to slowly begin to change. And we have to look into having, putting better quality stores in those neighborhoods that are, uh, that they would call impoverished or uh, poverty neighborhoods. That's that absolutely correct. Yeah, so we, did, we have to work that, on that. Exactly. But talking about that too, I, you know, I was looking at some of the foods that I was getting from the food bank and who wants to eat sardines with jalapeno peppers in them? <laughs> some of the stuff that was coming from the food. <laughs> yeah, sardines. Yeah, I'm yeah. not into sardines. Jalapeno peppers is okay, but my sardines, mm, nah. <laughs> but not with jalapeno peppers in them, but anyway. Right, right. The <laughs> they say, Mommy, are you hungry? I said, No, Mommy ate already. Here, you <laughs> let me feed you some good Right. Food. It's just recognizing the importance of feeding your children properly, feeding your, making mm-hmm. sure that your children eat their vegetables and eat, you know, the proper food and making sure mm-hmm, we eat the proper mm-hmm. lifestyle changes. And so, you know, it's just important to eat correctly. So I can't right. say that I eat properly all the time because when I get a little bit stressed, I'm grabbing me some chocolate bars and some Twix and some Snickers. And so right. I'm, I'm going right. to change that. Um, making sure that right. you drink a lot of water is important. So I stopped drinking mm-hmm. a, soda a long mm-hmm. time ago. So, you know, I got rid of the soda, you know, and all that extra Good. sugar. Um, so I, I'm trying to find a way, a better way of dealing with my stress than eating candy bars. So I do, I do practice yoga. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I do more walking than oh, I do before. Love yoga. Yeah, I do enjoy mm-hmm. yoga quite a bit. Um, I do enjoy Pilates if it doesn't hurt. I like <laughs> Pilates. Yeah, Pilates yeah. and yoga, I do enjoy quite a bit. And I'm doing uh-huh. more, more walking. So understanding right. that exercise is very important and what you eat and put in your body is more important. And I was always the strange one in my house, um, in my mm-hmm. family, in that when I got pregnant with my first daughter, I started um, doing herbal teas. And I'm talking mm. about 
not not celestial seasonings, but I would right. come home with raspberry leaf tea in bulk in a plastic bag, and I would keep it in the kitchen. And when people come in, they would they would look at me and they would look at the bag and they'd look at me. I said, no, that is not what you think it is. It is tea. You mm-hmm. don't tea. Roll it. You don't roll right. it. Right. No. You right. Tea. Right. <laughs> People didn't right. you know, they weren't used to seeing, you know, bag leaf. So I started, you know, doing things like that. And with my kids, mm-hmm. when they started to get a cough, you know, it was echinacea tea and golden golden seal tea. And golden seal, right. Fact, they would not, as a matter of fact, I don't think they even tasted Lipton tea till they were about seven or eight. And so okay. people thought I was a bit weird. Weird in a good way. In a good way. I <laughs> so... You know, I say make, weird in a good way. Trying to make good choices. And now my daughter is, mm-hmm. um, she's, she's kind of weird like that too, but she's kind of, she's gone way above, you know, she, she's, she's really <laughs> <laughs> with the chemicals. She reads, she says, nope. And she can read those chemicals and she'll put it back in a minute. And I said, what is that? What is that again? <laughs> so, so she's right. Like, and you can't even pronounce it and you trying to sound it out and, you know, dextrose, mono, whatever. You know, all of these different names and you're trying like, what, what is this? Put I it know. back. If, you know, if I don't have simple ingredients, then I don't need to have it. Just exactly. put it back on the shelf, you know. Exactly. Yeah, so, so it's, it's making true small beauty, steps. True, true beauty comes from the inside out. So taking definitely. care of yourself from the inside out, definitely. Mm-hmm. And definitely from mm-hmm. the outside in. You know, of course, you know, we women, you know, feel better when we look better. So, you know. Right care of your skin you have gorgeous skin marcia absolutely gorgeous skin. oh thank you i'm yeah. looking at your skin flawless flawless, flawless. I'm at your skin flawless, flawless. <laughs> <laughs> thank you i do share uh, an anti-aging line of skincare products and you know they're plant-based and and that sort of thing oh, with good. a lot of um it's plant-based in science so um mm-hmm. you know when you get older you need to take better care of your mature skin so you know, right. it's important to do that. So I'm focusing on some of those things and, and I'm going to be Good. adding CBD products with that line. So I think it's important to take care inside and out. So definitely. I agree with you 100%. Definitely. And when, so my question to you, my last question for you is that I have, when can we look forward to this uh, skincare line or anti-aging? When can we look forward to seeing those products? Well, as a matter of fact, I'm working with uh, a company right now, and I'll be happy to share that information with you great. shortly. Great, great, great. So, yeah, we'll have all of those information. You'll send me that over, and we'll have all of that information for, for our audience listening to it. Renee, you have been so awesome. I love listening to you. Oh. Love listening to your stories. It's so intriguing, inspiring. Um, you are going to help so many people and I thank you. Continue being of service. You know, we really, we're going to do something again. We have got to do something again, as far as like, you know, with, as far as having healthy food in our neighborhoods, you know, for people who are not able to spend the money to shop at Whole Foods, right. And be able to buy those help, all those expensive items because they, they cost more because they buy it. They, they get it wholesale and then they sell it retail, you know, But uh, like I mentioned before, your local farmer's market, you can get things. And even some community centers, they grow these natural gardens. Those are things that you can look. Some communities have natural gardens where you can come and shop and buy things. So support your community. I tell anybody, support your community, support your own, because it's helping you as well as them. Because we are all one. We're all part of a community. Yes, we are. And Marsha, you're going to help me with my eating because I need to do better at my eating. So that's all right. Slow progress. Some progress is better than no progress at all. Yes, ma'am. Yes, (laughs) ma'am. Yes. So that is all. Thank you so much, Renee, um, for being a guest on our show. And I look forward to speaking with you soon. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And thank you. It has been such a You're welcome. You're welcome. You are so welcome. Stay blessed and we will talk soon. Absolutely. You have a good All righty. Okay, bye-bye. Bye.